This content may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. He whipped it around towards me, and in the most sinister way, he laughed at me and his brother. He waved the knife around between us. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I felt like a deer in the headlights, frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Thanks to the fun and challenging Best Fiends for supporting Disturbed. Best Fiends is the binge-worthy mobile puzzle game. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play, plus earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Welcome back in everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you three true horrifying tales and a listener voicemail that are sure to give you the chills. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. We open the show with an email submission from Mandy, featuring voice work by Rhiannon Mauschel, and we endure the babysitting job from hell. This is the story of the worst and scariest babysitting experience of my life. I was about 19 years old, back before cell phones. My friend Eric had worked part-time at a funeral home in town. He had a coworker, a mortician, who needed an overnight babysitter for his two young boys, about ages three and five. The dad of these boys was on call at night sometimes. In case somebody died, he needed to pick up the body and transport it to the funeral home. His wife, the mom, was a hospital nurse working the night shift. When their nighttime shifts lined up, they essentially needed a backup like me to sleep over at their house, in case the dad got called to pick up a deceased body. I agreed because I thought it would be easy money, that basically I'd be getting paid to sleep. I trusted the situation because Eric was my friend, and the mortician was his friend. I went over to their apartment late one fall evening for my first night on the job. The mom gave me a quick rundown of the apartment, where everything was, what I needed to do, and then she left for work. It was just the kids, the dad, and me. Soon after she left, while we were in the kitchen, the three-year-old, in the blink of an eye, pulled open a drawer, quickly stuck his hand in it, and pulled out a huge knife. He whipped it around towards me, and in the most sinister way, he laughed at me and his brother. He waved the knife around between us, I was actually scared this toddler was going to stab me or even worse, his brother. He moved so fast, I couldn't grab the blade, otherwise I'd be cut. Luckily, his dad rushed into the kitchen, calmed the kid down, and took the knife away. The dad chuckled and said something like, boys will be boys. Oh my God, what had I gotten myself into? Eventually, the boys were off to bed, but getting them to sleep wasn't easy. I struggled getting them to wind down. They were so hyper. The dad didn't offer any help. He just sat on the couch watching TV. Then, as a surprise to me, there was a knock at the door. It was a friend of the dad's with a case of beer in hand. This wasn't exactly a welcomed development. I tried to do some homework, but it was awkward sitting in a room with two adult men who were total strangers to me. The more they drank, the rowdier they got, the more uncomfortable I became. This was my cue to go to bed. I had class in the morning anyway. I tried to go to sleep, but I tossed and turned for quite a while. The men were not quiet. There was a thin wall separating my room and the living room. Just as I was finally drifting off, the bedroom door creaked open, and in the doorway stood who I believed to be the dad. I had my back to him so he didn't see my eyes pop open wide in panic. The room I was in was still dark, but I could see a beam of light hitting the wall in front of me. 
yet I remained still, paralyzed with fear. I could feel his presence and hear him breathing. Was I crazy to think I detected a putrid chemical smell? Or was that my imagination knowing he was a mortician? I knew he had been drinking. I remained frozen in place. I couldn't tell you how long he stood there, but it felt like forever. Eventually, I heard the door close and he left. What the hell was he thinking? Was I in danger? Was there a phone in this room? Where was his friend? If I screamed, someone would hear me. The boys would wake up, right? Should I leave? Could I leave? It was a small apartment. I would have to pass through the living room where they were in order to get out. Not having answers, I just laid there with my mind spinning. Before I had time to build up my courage to do something, he came back. Again, the creep stood there in the doorway and just watched me sleep. He left only to come back again later in the night to just stand there and stare. And by this time, the TV had been turned off and his friend had gone home. I'm not sure what time it was. I just remember the apartment being so quiet and still. This had only made it easier to hear him breathing and to hear the floor creak from his body occasionally shifting back and forth in the doorway. My gut was telling me not to wake up, so I stayed still. I kept thinking, just a little while until the mom comes home. Or maybe someone will die and he'll be called away. What a terrible thing to hope for. Eventually, he left me alone and I guess went to bed. I didn't sleep a wink that entire night. I just laid there on guard until I heard the mom put the key in the door very early the next morning. I jumped out of bed, grabbed my things, said only a couple of words to her, and left. I didn't even stick around long enough to get paid. I didn't care. I just wanted to leave that apartment forever and never go back. It's remarkable that the scariest thing to happen to me that night wasn't a three-year-old boy threatening me with a large knife. Looking back, I feel foolish for not giving my parents or friends the phone number and address of where I was. I didn't even meet the family first. And when the dad was acting so inappropriately, I wish I could have had the courage to call my parents or leave. But it's still uncertain what he would have done if he had known I was awake. Would that have shifted the atmosphere and led to something worse? I'll never know. Are you listening alone? Rather brave of you. Up next, we check in with Reddit user Alon51 and introducing our newest storyteller to the show, Dave Takara, and we find something very unexpected. Several years back, I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them, I opened up and saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and I saw that I didn't think that it was mine, but when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sorted by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it. 
and I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house, and I decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day, but this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw a movement, and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me, and immediately I turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, it never gave me a problem. As someone who has already experienced things like a home invasion, I would always suggest that you lock your doors, because you can never know what people can do when they are in your house. Are you terrified yet? You will be. Now picture this. It's just a normal evening. We eat dinner as always. Maybe talk about the day, work or school. Everything is as it always is. But then, out of nowhere, I'm gone. Vanished without a trace. Your heart is pumping. You can't find me anywhere. And then, you do finally find me, just scoring some quality alone time with best fiends. Now, others might wonder about your mysterious disappearances, but if you're having as much fun playing best fiends as I am, it's no wonder why you just have to sneak off and play. And I've been playing so much recently that I'm already up to level 248 and counting. And I have to tell you, there's just nothing like that unbeatable rush of adrenaline you get when you beat a level and move up. For me personally, it's one of the best ways I've found to unwind and de-stress after a day of working on Disturbed, or even just in between recording sessions. Now I've been playing for over a year now and I can honestly say the game helps to keep me mentally sharp and even a bit more focused after I've finished up a session of playing. And one of the most fun parts of the game is being able to have fun and engaging competitions with your friends. Once you find that person to go back and forth with and brag about what level you're up to and compete with, it just unlocks a whole new dimension of fun to the game. You can power up your favorite fiends to new levels and even more powerful skills and watch them transform as they get stronger. And brand new events and challenges pop up all year round, so you always have a chance to earn exclusive in-game items, characters, and rewards. We here at Disturbed love best fiends and have yet to find a better way to pass the time in between recording and editing the show, so I'm confident it's a game that you'll find just as fun and beneficial as I do. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play, plus earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Can't get enough disturbed? We've got you covered on Patreon with monthly bonus episodes, ad-free listening, shoutouts, and more. Visit disturbedpodcast.com slash support. You'll be glad you did. Now back to the deliciously frightful. Disturbed Podcast with your host, Chad.
Now let's hear from one of our listeners straight off the hotline at disturbedpodcast.com slash hotline, which is free and available to all listeners. So let's keep those submissions coming in. And this one comes in from a listener who would like to remain anonymous. My husband and I moved to this new town about two years ago. Everyone said that we were moving to the safest part of this town. We're young and we don't have children, so we thought it would be fun to move to a shopping center. Our apartments are right above it. It is a lot of fun. There's restaurants, there's shopping, a movie theater, grocery store, bookstore, just about anything that you could think of. So to be quite honest, we hardly ever leave it. My husband, in fact, has told people on several occasions that he's so grateful that we live somewhere where he doesn't feel nervous about me being alone or being by myself. One of my favorite things to do is to take a walk. A lot of evenings after work, I'll go walk around in the shopping center. There's usually people, there's supposed to be security, it's well lit and I don't stay out past dark. But I do this pretty often. Um, If I'm not walking to the gym across the complex, then I'm usually just walking around the complex just for exercise. So frequently on my walks, I would see an older man sitting by himself. Sometimes he was on a bench in the plaza. Sometimes he was sitting outside a boutique. Sometimes he was sitting outside a restaurant. But he was always by himself. And as far as I could tell, he never had anything to like entertain himself with. Like no phone, no magazine, no book, nothing like that. He was always just kind of watching. And to be honest... Every time I got near him, I felt a really terrible feeling. It was one of those like fight or flight, like my flight was fully activated. Like my heart sped up, my stomach just like tensed up, everything in me was like screaming to run away. So if I saw him in the distance, I would divert my path to where I wouldn't walk by him. But sometimes he would be sitting around a corner and I would be caught off guard or he'd be walking around the corner. And so I wouldn't have a choice except to go right by him. In those instances, I can't even tell you how physically uncomfortable I felt. And the entire time, I felt so guilty because I kept thinking, gosh, like, why am I so judgmental? I don't even know this person. This older man may just want to sit here and be among people and not be home by himself. Like maybe he's just lonely. And I kept thinking that and I kept chiding myself and saying, why are you so judgmental? But I couldn't help it. I really could not help how I felt. And sometimes if he was sitting in like the right position, the right area, he could see my apartment complex. So I would always like go to the back of the complex and enter that way because I did not want him to see me going in the front entrance. There's a parking lot behind the complex, so he could have thought I was leaving in my car, and he would have been none the wiser that I lived there. That's how uncomfortable it made me. So the other night, there was apparently a shooting. I woke up to a text from my mom freaking out because there had been a shooting at the shopping center. She knew that we were okay because the report said there were no injuries, But moms are going to worry, and she was freaked out that there was a shooting where I live. And, I mean, to be honest, it freaked me out, too. Nothing like that happens here. Nothing like that is supposed to happen. But the initial report said that it was 10 o'clock at night. I never go out that late, especially by myself. And then it also said that it was a domestic incident. So I thought it didn't really apply to me. Made me feel a little bit better. So honestly, I forgot about it after that until yesterday when my mom sent me a text and she said that they had caught him and she said the full report was very different than what was initially released. So first of all, the full report stated that the shooting had occurred at 7.30. The lockdown was lifted at 10. Also, (laughs) it was not a domestic incident. A man had taken a woman at gunpoint into the parking garage and he had 
forced her into her car, driven her up to the top level, assaulted her, and then driven her back down. And when he drove her back down, her boyfriend was there. And the man attempted to drive away with her in the car, and so her boyfriend chased after them. Well, when he apparently got to the red light that would have turned on to, like, an actual street instead of, like, inside the complex, she was able to jump out. And her boyfriend saw the man pull out a gun and pointed at her. And so he, the boyfriend, pulled out his own gun and started shooting at the man. So the man was identified, arrested. They found in his trunk, they found masks and guns and BB guns and rope, all kind of things. And anyway, so my mom, my mom sent me this and there was a part of the article where the man said that he enjoyed sitting in the shopping center, watching the women that he had been like stalking the shopping center. As soon as she said that, my stomach just dropped. I sent her a physical description of the guy, the older guy that I always saw. And she said, yep, that's him. And she sent me a picture. And again, my stomach dropped. Honestly, I started sweating. My heart was like beating so fast because it was that older man, the man that I had passed so many times by myself. The one that had smiled at me, had tell, told me hello, as to how I was doing when I passed him. I had been in his path so many times, and I felt bad for being afraid of him and for feeling terrible around him. But my gut was right. My gut was completely right. Honestly, ever since, I've just felt super sick and scared. I go to a kickboxing class at the gym in the complex, and all the women are pretty terrified. Uh, like I said, that kind of thing is not supposed to happen here. And it was 7.30. It wasn't even late at night. And that same complex is where I walk all the time. I have seen this man. So anyway, it just really, really scared me because I thought that could have been me so easily. There were so many times that I was by myself and there weren't many people around and I didn't see any security guards and it could have been me. I'm so grateful that her boyfriend was there and I'm so grateful that she got away and that he was caught and I hope if there's any other victims that they're able to get justice for what he's done and my main takeaway is just to follow your gut, follow your instinct. Um, when I was telling the story to someone else, she said something that I'll never forget. She said, we as women, unfortunately, do not have the luxury of politeness. We always have to trust our instincts, always. Are you loving the show? Let us know with a positive rating and review. In return, we'll help you hide the body. And finally, we close out the show hearing from Reddit user Meanwhile in Paris, featuring voice work by Tanya E.B., and we decide whether or not to open the door. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and was studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking intensely at me, I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time, his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like a prey being stalked. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button and waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder, and there he was, a few meters behind. I had the distressing feeling his eye had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop, took my phone, and pretended to be taking a call. 
When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back in the busy street. I zigzagged, crossed the street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was, his alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbing the stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, locked it, and froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now he knew my name. Gabriel? Oh shit, I felt like a deer in the headlights, frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. Somehow I couldn't move or speak. Come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see I am not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up, in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed hours. When I finally managed to calm myself, I called my long-distance boyfriend. Call the police, he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important, perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while I felt better. Safe. We started laughing. Suddenly, the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home. I answered. Gabriel, said the voice. Open, please. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabriel, let me in. I am so thirsty, he said. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in a corner, literally in recovery position, terrified. I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again. And again. I didn't answer this time. I crouched to the sofa and fell asleep in exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning, afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad, who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox. Gabriel, I am a nice guy. You should have opened to me. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened and of course told me that I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors asking to not open the door to anyone they didn't expect. He sat in the cafe in front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw the stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and looked back every few meters. Today, I am still very observing of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I am not expecting someone. So people, if you ever find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe, everyone. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Submit your own experience to the show in writing or through our hotline, all at disturbedpodcast.com. Disturbed is an independent production funded through advertising and your support. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get early access to our premium feed featuring ad-free listening and bonus episodes. Visit patreon.com slash disturbed podcast to learn more. And let's shout out our newest supporters, Jamie Flenner, Katrina, and Jessica. They all get instant access to our catalog of bonus episodes, ad-free listening, and 24-hour early episode releases, and you can too. Join today at patreon.com slash disturbed podcast. Music by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening.
We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.